Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Well, welcome, everyone. I don't think John Scott needs any introduction, but I'd like to thank him for doing another talk for us. John is now medical director for telehealth for all of the university and is really one of the thought leaders in telehealth and ECHO model, and I will turn it over to John. Great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, happy New Year to everyone, and uh, some really exciting news and new developments in the area of hepatitis C that I wanted to share with you today. Some of you may have been uh, keeping track of in the, in the uh, popular literature, there were two new hepatitis C drugs approved towards the end of 2013, and so I'm going to go through those medicines today. The objectives for the next 15 minutes are to understand the proper dose and duration of sofosbuvir and also to know the common side effects and drug-drug interactions. Fortunately, it's not as complicated as some of the prior antivirals for hep C. And then I wanted to give you a sense for what's coming down the, the pipeline. A great step forward with sofosbuvir, but um, as you'll see, we'll still have to use interferon for the next little bit, at least for a uh, majority of our patients, but um, that, that'll someday be coming to an end. So I just want to give you an idea of how to weigh that decision of um, treating now versus uh, waiting. So first of all, I want to talk about sofosbuvir. This is a um, HCV-specific nucleotide analog. It, um, we also call it a, a polymerase inhibitor or a, a nucleoside inhibitor. It's very safe and well-tolerated, a key difference to, uh, compared to some of our prior uh, directly act acting antivirals. Take it once a day. You can take it with or without food. Um, it doesn't have that many drug-drug uh, interactions, just about three or four and uh, really safe, uh, so that's a big difference between also some of the other drugs. Um, it doesn't seem to have uh, much resistance. It has a very high barrier resistance. There's only been one observed uh, case of resistance, and it also is active against all the different genotypes of hepatitis C, so genotypes one through six. And we have quite a bit of database now on um, hep C patients, over 3,000 patients. So this is the label for sofosbuvir. Its trade name is uh, Sovaldi. So this is for hepatitis C genotype 2 and 3 naives, genotype 2 and 3 intolerant or non-responders, genotype 1 and 4 naives and PEG ribo failures, including uh, cirrhotics, but they can't be uh, uh, decompensated cirrhotics. And then also there's this, um, some unique aspects in the label here, a little bit more expansive than we thought was going to happen. So patients who have liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and are waiting liver transplant can also get so phosphorvir. The last thing that I bolded here is that there is an indication for HIV positive patients, a real surprise for I think a lot of people. And you're basically not going to dose um, patients any differently if they're HIV positive versus HIV negative. So it, uh, it comes in a 400 milligram tablet that you would prescribe daily. And I want to go through uh, the duration. So if you have a genotype 1 patient who's naive or a PEG ribo failure and they can be HIV positive or negative, you're going to give them just a straight 12-week course of three medicines, sofosbuvir, pegylated interferon, and ribavirin. If you have a genotype 2 patient that can be a naive and, or a PEG ribo failure, also 12 weeks, but in, there's no interferon in that equation. For genotype 3 naive or PEG ribo failures, you've got to go a little bit longer, 24 weeks. And then anyone who's got liver cancer awaiting uh, liver transplantation go for 48 weeks of therapy. There is this little phrase, however, um, that um, for patients who are interferon and ineligible, that it's, it can be considered uh, for a genotype 1 patient. The, the response rate is lower, um, but it's not uh, zero. So that's uh, another thing to kind of uh, consider. So um, I want to review the, the, um, the data that was used for the FDA labeling. And this is the Photon 1 study that was presented in November at the uh, International Liver Meeting in Washington, D.C. And this was a, a three-arm study of genotype 1 treatment-naive patients, genotype 2-3 treatment-naives, and then genotype 2-3 treatment-experienced patients. And they were randomized to receive 24 weeks of cefosfavir plus ribavirin, 12 weeks of sofosbuvir plus ribavirin, or 24 weeks of sofosbuvir ribavirin. They had a very large range of ARVs, including all the first and second line ARVs. Compensated cirrhotics were included, and uh, in terms of the HIV criteria, 
They had to be undetectable for at least eight weeks and either um, a CD4 count of 200 if they're on ARVs or over 500 if um, not currently on antiretrovirals. So these are the um, cure rates, the, uh, and we are now using SBR12 instead of 24 weeks. So the genotype 1s, um, very rapid clearance. Um, you know, almost all the people have cleared by week 4 in the blue there, and a, and a cure rate of 76%. That compares to around 90%. For genotype, uh, for genotype one HIV negatives, but was um, not statistically different. For genotype twos, they do very well, 88% cure rate, and a genotype three um, had a 67% cure rate, so a little bit lower. I think if there's any kind of chink in the armor of sulfosbuvir, it's in those uh, genotype three patients. So, what about adverse events, and particularly focusing on? Um, HIV specific adverse events. There was really no difference in the HIV positive population compared to the HIV negatives. Um, there were two patients who had um, detectable HIV RNA, but that was uh, determined to be due to poor adherence, and there was no appreciable change in the CD4 count. So the side effects of sulfosbuvir when you compare it with interferon, you see less fatigue. You still see it though. Less headache, less nausea, less insomnia less anemia. I mean, basically all the side effects go down and really the, um, the side effects are mostly from the ribavirin. And just to review, the ribavirin side effects are anemia, rash, and a kind of an ACE inhibitor type cough. However, I just want to give you a little word of caution. We've, we've used this in 3,000 patients, so there's still a possibility for some rare side effects. And there are at least three or four other um, medications have not gone as far in the testing as um, sulfosbuvir. And they were held up because they had some cardiac issues, in particular long QT syndrome, some hepatic issues with ALT flares and GI toxicity. So as a class, this is what we've seen and, and probably what you want to have your antennas out for. Um, I, we don't need to uh, get baseline EKGs or anything like that, just, but just um, be aware of those. And uh, there really was, as I said, there's no difference between triple therapy uh, of uh, sulfosphorus, PEG, and ribavirin versus just interferon ribavirin alone in a really low dropout rate. So. This is much better tolerated than um, prior produce inhibitors. So how do you monitor these patients? For genotype 1 and 4 patients, these are going to be people on interferon. So you do need to get um, a baseline TSH. Uh, you want to get your baseline HIV um, labs and uh, also would get um, a, a CBC with differential. And the CBC with differential is what you're going to be tracking as well as the TSH at 12 weeks. Um, a little bit less intensive monitoring for our twos and threes. You don't need to get a differential on your CBC, uh, you know, not as many LFTs because you're less likely to have a flare uh, in a non-interferon-based regimen. So the only thing I would say is that if you have a patient who's cirrhotic, um, you might want to add more LFTs um, to the regimen. This is a kind of a, a minimum amount of laboratory monitoring. I do want to point out that you don't see a lot of HCV RNA tests here. It's really basically before treatment, at the end of treatment and then check for your cure. So really three tests. Um, there's none of this response guided therapy like we had previously. And obviously if a patient gets anemia, you, you want, we want to monitor that a little more frequently. So how do you manage anemia? Uh, this is unchanged from what our strategy was before. So if you have a patient without any cardiac disease, if their hemoglobin gets below 10, you want to drop the ribavirin from weight-based ribavirin, so around 1,000 to 1,200, all the way down to 600, pretty steep drop. And, and continue to follow that. If it ever gets below 8.5, then you would drop the, the ribavirin completely. A little bit a stricter criteria, if the patient has cardiac disease, you use the, the drop as an indicator. Anything over two grams, then you drop it to 600, and anything that does not get back over 12 after four weeks of this reduced dose, then you wanna completely stop your ribavirin. So what about drug-drug interactions? Um, so sofosbuvir is metabolized by the human catepsin A, uh, carboxylesterase and histidine triadine nucleotide binding protein, uh, which that kind of just rolls off the tongue. Um, the important thing is it's not an inducer or inhibitor of the CYP450 uh, system, which is where we see a lot of the drug interactions of the protease inhibitors. Uh, it's um, a substrate of the PGP and uh, breast cancer reporter uh, protein. So the, these are the ones that you should not use with sulfosporous. St. John's word is a Herbal medicine, some people use for um, depression. Rifamycins, phenytoin, or carbamazepine. And then a very important here that I put in bold is topranavir ritonavir. I know very few people use it, but that's the only HIV regimen that um, is contraindicated. 
than many other medications like methadone, uh, the first line regimens and even the second line regimens for HIV are permitted. Um, I don't think dolutegivir is on here just because it's, it's newer, but raltegivir is and I don't think there's going to be any difference with that. And then a lot of the immunosuppressants uh, for our post-transplant patients are okay. So a question that comes up a lot is, well, how expensive is this medicine? It's really expensive. So $1,000 per pill. Uh, so just kind of put that in perspective. That's 84000 just for the sulfosbuvir for the minimum course of 12 weeks and 168000 for 24 weeks. I've written about 12 prescriptions, and three of them have been filled so far. In fact, the very first patient I got on it was in a co-infected patient who had commercial insurance. And uh, I think the ones that are slowest are the Medicaid patients, but uh, they are starting to get approved. There are um, lots of ways to get support for our patients, and I've, I've got some things listed here. And this includes a copay coupon program, a patient assistance program for uninsured patients, and then a, a patient access network foundation for high deductibles. So what about the coming pipeline? There, there are, are um, several other Proteus inhibitors that are FDA approved for ACV patients without uh, HIV, and those are telaprevir, bosaprevir, and another drug called semeprevir that was FDA approved in November. It is not labeled for um, HIV positive, so I didn't really mention that too much. I don't think it's as good as sulfosprevir because it has a lower cure rate it has uh, more drug-drug interactions, and you, you see a lot more resistance, um, and you also see a rash with that. So it kind of falls down on, on three or four very important criteria, and, and I really don't see us using semaprivir by itself for our hep C patients. Um, the, the upcoming drugs for pretty samples are the uh, Merck drug of 5172, which has a little different resistance profile. It's very potent. And then the, um, what you'll see in about a year are the NS5A inhibitors. These are extremely potent, so picomolar level potency um, and a pretty good drug-drug uh, interaction profile. Uh, the drugs that are coming out will be Ducladisvir, which is a BMS drug, and Ladipisvir. Uh, we'll probably see those in, the, in about 12 months from now. And then you'll see some other non-nucleoside inhibitors um, uh, in the Gilead and Abbott uh, uh, pipeline. These are just some of them. You'll probably hear about another 10 or 12. It's really going to get uh, complicated and, and crowded here pretty soon. So, you know, we, we've got some great regimens now. We're seeing 75 to 90 percent or 70 to 90 percent cure rate and much shorter, much less toxic. So, you know, how do we think about these patients? A genotype 2 or 3 now, I think with, when you take the interferon out of the picture, that really seems to open up the field. Um, you know, it's much less toxic. And I would would argue that you should really lean towards treating these patients, any genotype two or three. Uh, genotype one or four, um, you could consider treating it. Obviously, the, the interferon might be the biggest uh, uh, issue and in, in considering the neuropsychiatric side effects um, and the cytopenias that sometimes develop in those patients. And I would just say that, you know, if, you, if you've got a whole bunch of patients, you want to prioritize those patients who have more advanced fibrosis, the genotype, uh, the stage three and stage four be first, and, and also anyone who you've had struggle with iris of the liver, sometimes if you can get rid of the hep C, then you won't have all these flares once you get them on ARVs. So that's kind of my thinking about this. Um, this is not any kind of guideline at this point. We will see ASLD guidelines probably in the next month or so, um, but this is just my own personal take on it. So that's all I have, and I welcome any questions or comments.